healed of something today. You've got stripes, you've got wounds that some of people in the church today need. Some people in the church today have fear that they'll never be healed. Some of the church people today doubt that God has a healing hand ready for them. Some of you today have been healed from the impossible. Some of you today here have a testimony that is a breaker anointing for the church members today that need a little bit of oomph, that need a little bit more belief, that need a little bit more hope. So here's what I want right now as we move into a worship moment of intercession as Legacy Nashville. If you have a testimony of healing, God wants to use your story right now. If you have a testimony that God has healed you, delivered you, rescued you from something, I want you to raise your hand right now with the shout of praise to the King of Kings. Christ 
grace that was spilled on the cross is the same blood that is for us to heal anything that needs to be healed. And so God, we say yes and amen. And we say we believe in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, and the church said, not in the business of entertaining or being entertained. God is in the business of his sons and his daughters. God is in the business of healing you, of delivering you. He don't want to be entertained. He don't need to be entertained. His blood wasn't spilled to be entertained during a worship set. His blood wasn't spilled for you to entertain him with your worship for 27.32 seconds on a Sunday. His blood was spilled to heal you. And so here's what I want you to do today. I want you on the count of three, I want you to get a skip in your step. I want you to release the dance that you've got. I want you to release the mighty roar that the, that the Lord has put in you. And on the count of three, I want you to praise the King of Kings from a place of knowing that His blood was spilt for you not to be entertained. On the count of three, one, two, three. Can we give a round of praise for this amazing worship team that leads from a place that has stories of being resurrected in Christ. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for your offering. Now, as you find your way back to your seats, whew, I tell you, God is all up in our business and I am so happy for it. Bless the Lord as you find your seats. Will you please turn your attention to the screen for some important video announcements? Well, as I said, we have a real special experience today. We have a dear friend of mine who's more than a friend. He's my covenant brother, Pastor Teo Hayashi, all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So... One of the things that I do whenever I bring in a guest that I don't know very well is I, I read their resume because I'm getting to know them as you're getting to know them. And then when I have one of my friends, I don't usually read their resume. I just like, here's my homeboy. <laughs> y'all gonna like him because y'all like me. So, um, and so that's how I introduced Teo in the first two services. I'm like, hey, it's my family. But I thought to myself in the second one, I was like, you know what I should probably do? I should probably tell our church, people who are unfamiliar with his ministry, what God has done uh, through Dunamis and Zion. Uh, Teo is the pastor of a church called Zion and it is in five nations. So they have planted churches in five different nations. Uh, God's doing an amazing work through that church. And then he's also the founder and leader of a movement in South America called Dunamis Movement. Started in Brazil and they're in 10 nations, over 10 nations now, all over the world, advancing the kingdom of Jesus uh, in universities, planting small groups, hosting conferences, uh, worship experiences. And it's amazing what God has done in his life as well as his wife's junior over the last what 15 20 years t has it been that long 15 15 years incredible man absolutely incredible um i met t in la actually um about 10 years ago probably and uh i know you're not going to tell it but i don't think he liked me at first uh because he was like that kid is trying to be too cool he's trying to dress too cool uh, but 
you know, I had this thing, it's probably the Southern, you know, hospitality that I carry. I can't stand if anybody doesn't love me. So I just wear them down eventually. I'm like, you're going to love me. I don't know if you think you're going to or not, but I'm going to tell you, we're going to be BFFs. Um, and so, you know, God has blessed that desire. And we have literally preached the gospel together all around the world. Uh, we've preached in Europe. We've preached in Asia. We've done a couple of trips to Japan, trip to Amsterdam. I've been to Brazil on a number of occasions to be with him. And so I just want you guys to know uh, who you're hearing from today. Yes, he is my friend. And to me, that's the most important. But he's also a friend of God. And he's also a general, in my perspective, in the kingdom. And I was in a room whenever he received a prophetic word. Probably won't like me saying this, but they're prophesying over and say, you're going to be the Billy Graham of this generation. And uh, if there's anybody that I know uh, that could possibly fill those shoes, it's my friend Teofilo. So I want to ask you guys to stand to your feet, please, and bless him as he comes to preach to us today. All right, thank you, Lord. Let's, let's give Jesus a big clap offering. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. And while we're just praising the Lord, can you raise both of your hands up and just look to the Lord and just say with me, Holy Spirit, we honor you in this place. Would you intensify your presence? Would you make me more aware of you? Would you touch my heart, bring alignment, renew my mind, renew my first love, renew my passion and fire for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give Jesus another big clap offering. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I feel so at home here. And uh, this is home away from home. I was telling people that there are certain places around the globe that for me, is, they're just like home away from home. And, and uh, one of these places is here in uh, Nashville and uh, with Legacy, my church family here in Nashville. And uh, Lyle and Allison are dear, dear friends. They're family to us. Um, Lyle is too generous with his uh, introductions. And that uh, <laughs> threw me off a bit there. I forgot, I forgot the mic in the chair there. But anyways... Uh, but we, 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 go, we go back, and uh, we've, we've seen a lot, and we've been fortunate to see the Lord use us despite of our humanities. And uh, so, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's everything by the grace of God, and he takes all the glory and honor. Amen? Um, yeah, I want to share with you real quick, if you could just open with me Mark chapter 10. My wife, Junia, sends her greetings and her love. She couldn't be with me. Uh, here we had a four-month-old surprise uh, show up, and it's our baby daughter Kyla. And so we got three boys, one girl, and uh, the two boys, uh, older ones, seven, five. Uh, we thought, you know, you, you get through the whole baby stage, and now they're getting more independent, and then suddenly a one and a half, and then a four-month-old, and now we're back at it again. And so it's awesome. Uh, but anyways. Uh, was texting with her real quick in between service, sends her love, and, and uh, we've been in Brazil, or I've been in Brazil for the last 15 years, and uh, before coming or moving to Brazil, I was in North Carolina, and uh, that was home, and I shared a little bit about this because I really believe that there's, there's nothing better than you taking steps of obedience. You know, um, steps of obedience, sometimes they could come at a cost but uh and sometimes not but you know usually they do but uh at in the big picture it only it makes sense and for me when i think about faith and when i think about my spiritual life and when i think about my relationship with the lord nothing makes sense if i don't look at it in the long run you have to play the long game or else a lot of stuff that you're doing here doesn't make sense it's not even intelligent you know, certain things that we do, if we, are, we, if we don't have the long game in perspective, it's, uh, it's not the wisest choices. You know, there's things that you've, you, you put on the altar 
and people are looking at you asking, why would you do that? It just doesn't make sense. I'm not even talking about sin or not sinning. I'm just talking about choosing between what's good and what's best. I'm, I'm talking about choosing between what makes sense and what's wise. And uh, when you put things in the long game perspective, it starts making sense. So 15 years ago, um, I was uh, uh, a seminary student and uh, living in North Carolina, working on my MDiv. I was about to take over a, a well-structured uh, African-American church. I was a youth pastor there. My spiritual father was a senior pastor, and uh, he had invested in my life for over the last five years. I was dating a girl uh, that was in love with Jesus. Uh, I was on my way to becoming a U.S. citizen. And uh, after talking to my spiritual father, he said, uh, why don't you pray and take a time off for this season because I want you to transition to take over the church. And that's what I did. And as I was praying, the Lord asked me a question. Uh, and he asked me actually three times the same question. Are you going after the kingdom dream or the American dream? And uh, of course, we all know that when the Lord asks questions, he's not going after information. He's going after your heart. And so he gets to your heart through questions. And so that's what he did to me. And I said, Lord, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going after the queen kingdom dream or else you wouldn't have asked me that question. But um, I thought I was. What do I need to do? Well, so the Lord said, well, first thing you need to do is talk to the immigration lawyers, tell them to stop the process. Uh, this, is, this is not for you to keep doing it right now. And I don't know if, the, you know, what the future holds, but for now, he says, you know, stop that. That's number one. Number two is the girl you're with. My daughter fears the Lord. She's wonderful, but she's not your wife. And uh, so stop that right now. So I stopped that. And so that's my second Isaac. Um, and then he says, uh, third, he says, uh, your education, stop that too. You're becoming very proud with your intellect and very cold in your heart. And uh, you'll go back, but not now. So I stopped that. And uh, fourth, uh, I'm going to speak to your spiritual father, but you're not to take this church. And, uh, you know, my charismatic friends, Pentecostals, filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the fulfillment of all the prophecies you've received. That's what they said. Why would you turn your back on the promises of God? But I heard the Lord. I was convicted in my spirit. And I asked the Lord, after putting the four Isaacs on the altar, what do you, what do you have for me now? And the Lord says, I want you to go to Brazil. I said, Lord, Brazil is extremely evangelized. Huge churches, mega churches. I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I got a Y1 background, and I served in uh, India for a while. I thought maybe if, now that I've put all these Isaacs on the altar, he'll send me, I don't know, to the 1040 window somewhere in, like, in the Muslim world or something. And, and the Lord says, no, go to Brazil. I was like, Brazil is huge churches. I mean, so many Christians. And, 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 uh, and the Lord said, uh, I'm, I'm raising up a generation that will live revival that culminates into reformation. You know, uh, um, if we study, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all love revival here. I mean, the, 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 the theme of the year here at Legacy is in 2023 is a year of revival. Come on, in revival lovers here. If you love revival, and, and I mean, I've, I mean I've, I'm, not, I'm no expert, but I'm a lover of revival. I've studied revival. I've read about it. And the, the revivals that actually had lasting impact went through three phases. Usually they follow this pattern. And it begins with the awakening of the saints, which means it begins with the church. The word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So it begins with us. Judgment begins in the house of God, right? So it starts with us. You know, if we want to be the answer and we should be the ecclesia, should be pointing uh, the the nations to the Lord, if we are to be that, we should also be coherent and understand that there is huge responsibility with that authority. Therefore, judgment does need to come to us first. And there's a purging that happens in revival. And there's this uh, renewal that happens where the first love is restored to the church. And the body of Christ has this holy zeal for the presence. And so when you got those moves of the spirit where people will go for hours in the presence... And you lose track of time. You know, that's a sign of awakening. So it begins with the awakening of the saints. And then after you, you have the church awakened, the church naturally thinks, wow, this is so 
so amazing. This is heaven on earth. I wish my coworker who doesn't know Jesus would be here. I wish my uh, aunt that doesn't know Jesus would be here. And you start thinking about people that need a touch of God, which then leads you to the second phase of revival, which is the harvest of souls. And in the harvest of souls, there's evangelism. So you're bringing people to have encounters with the Lord. You're either bringing them into the presence or you're taking the presence to them. And they're having encounters with the Lord and they're getting saved. And after they're saved, you're discipling them and you're teaching the word and, the, and they're, they're getting grounded in their faith. And after they're getting grounded in the faith, I mean, the consequence of that is church growth. And because of church growth, I mean, you, you run out of seats, you run out of room. Oh, we've got to plant other churches then. And to plant other churches, you got to raise up other leaders. And so you start seminaries, you start schools of ministry and schools of leadership. And then uh, you start ordaining people into ministry. And, and that's growth. That's the harvest of souls. And, then, and occasionally you'll have people that have a heart for the unreached in other places. And the church will mobilize itself to send these people. We call them missionaries. And so these, these people will go to unreached people groups. And so you have mission movement happening, church growth movement, and that's the harvest of souls. That's the second stage. Now, the lasting impact of revival, history shows us, happens when we transition to the third stage, which is whatever is happening within the four walls of the church now starts going into the infrastructure of society. Starts going into the streets, starts going into education, starts going into the public sector of government. It starts going into arts entertainment. It starts forming culture. Starts forming the way that we see entertainment, where we see beauty. See, that, that's, that's when revival becomes reformation. It starts discipling thought. And we start thinking biblically, even when many people don't realize they're actually thinking biblically. And if you think about it, that is the history of Western civilization. Western civilization has its roots in the Protestant Reformation. And people were thinking biblically even though they did not realize that they're thinking biblically. That's why it's kind of interesting to see a lot of the uh, kids that are born in the Western civilization gleaning from the product, pro, uh, the product and the, the byproduct of Western civilization and believing something that is actually not what brought them to this place. So I was uh, in uh, Sevilla, which is the south of Spain, two weeks ago, speaking at a conference, and I was with a, uh, an apostolic figure. This, this, he's a father in, in Spain, of, of churches in Spain. And, and uh, there was also uh, pastors from Portugal and uh, this very known evangelist from Italy. And so we were all speaking at this conference, and in the green room conversations, I had a very interesting conversation. And uh, it came down to these three nations, Portugal, Spain, Italy. And if you know a little bit of history, these were countries that did not embrace the Protestant Reformation. Where the Catholic Church said, no, 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 not here. You're not bringing this here. And if you try to come here, we'll kill you. And to hear from the Protestant leaders of these nations, our country would be different. Or la the last Four, three, four, three, four, five hundred years of our nations would be different if we had just welcomed the revelation of what grace is, the revelation of biblical, uh, of biblical living, uh, of Christianity. And if that would have just, you know, seeped into to culture, that would have been totally different. And to hear from people from Spain and Italy say it's completely different in Europe, the south from Switzerland on to the north. And you think, wow. This is revival. Revival actually takes into consideration that what happens here could actually transform over there. And if you think about it, that's what the Lord intended it to be since the garden. Genesis 1.28, the cultural mandate. Multiply. Be fruitful. Handle the land. Administer. You know, the, the idea of Genesis 1.28 was... Heaven on earth in a garden to be spread out to the four corners of the world. Not by a, a snap of fingers, a miraculous, a Pentecostal experience, but by worship in the form of work. <laughs> work is worship. Now, we're thinking about work. Uh, I mean, that's probably a product of the curse. 
No, no, no. If you look at the scripture in Genesis 3, it's, it's the sweat. It's the tiredness. Do you get it? The thorns, the thistles. Work in itself is worship. So as we understand worship as work, as a, let's say, a chemistry teacher, as you're teaching chemistry, you're worshiping the Lord. As, as, as a painter, as you're painting and you're creating beauty, you're worshiping the Lord. As, as a, a mother that's taking care of kids, as you're nurturing them and teaching them over the dinner table, that's worship to the Lord. Does that make sense? And as, as we, we look at that, what is that? We're creating culture. At the end of the day, it's about creating culture. And it was supposed to be from the garden, the culture of heaven to be spread out across the land. Now, we know that the first Adam dropped the ball, but then the Lord sends the second Adam, right? And then he picks up from the cultural mandate with the great commission saying, go and make disciples of all nations. So that's what we're in this. That's the big picture of what we're doing here. Right? What we're doing here is we're living revival that culminates into transformation. And this transformation, you can call it a reformation or transformation, but at the end of the day, it has to do with heaven coming to earth. Now, of course, we believe that when Jesus comes back in his second coming, his kingdom will be fully and uh, established. But till then, will he find faith on earth? Amen. Till then, will you have faith? faith to keep pushing darkness and spreading light does that make sense and so that's why we're here and so when I read 2023 a year revival man my heart I was like I'm in the right place and so I'm so glad to be here with you I want to read from Mark chapter 10 and even as you're opening up to Mark 10 I was sharing the other services and they told me this is the hungriest service so you guys hungry right and Lyle just put us the best. The Lord saves the best for last. So anyways, Revelation 7-9 is, is one of those verses that for me personally speaking is like a finish line. You know, there's a, there's a few finish lines in, in the scripture. And, and for me, uh, besides Revelation 21, Revelation 7-9 is a quick picture of what eternity will be. And, and the word of God says that there will be a multitude that no man can count from every tongue, every nation, every tribe. And we will be worshiping before the throne of the Lamb. Think about that. You will one day be worshiping with every tribe, every tongue, every nation together. And I, I just want to think about this for a second. Just imagine you worshiping before the Lamb next to somebody from Morocco. Behind you, somebody is singing in Swahili from Kenya. In front of you, you got somebody Crying out in Russian. Next to you, somebody worshiping in Mandarin. Isn't that wonderful? That is the future. That's where we're going. That's the finish line. The Lord carries nations in his heart. And so why am I saying this? Because I believe this is a house of nations. Lyle said that I, initially I didn't like him, which is partially true. Um, I was just trying to figure him out. I'll tell you, the truth is, I was trying to figure you out. Because he looked stereotypically something in my mind, but when he started opening his mouth, I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Who is this kid? <laughs> he's, he's talking about reaching Japanese people, Korean people. He's talking about he spent time in Mozambique. He spent some time in India. I'm like, you don't look like that. <laughs> but immediately I'm like, I... Yeah, we got nations. We got this nations piece together. And why am I saying this? Because I believe there's a nations call on this house. There's a nations call on this house. That's why the Lord is always stretching us to think beyond ourselves. Thinking beyond our own culture, our own nationality, our own region, our own cities, our own states. You know, the Lord is, is trying to broaden us because at the end of the day, he doesn't want to build a Tower of Babel. The Lord wants to build the mandate he gave the following chapter. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel chapter, but soon as that is interrupted, how does he interrupt that? He confounds the language. 
Next day, imagine that. You're, you're working, building this huge building, and, and there's like the line of production and all of that, and suddenly you come to work the next day, and you can't communicate to the person next to you, and you're starting to look at each other. and like, What happened here? We, you can't understand me. He's looking at you. You don't understand me. And then suddenly, you're looking for somebody that can understand you, and then so you find that your buddies that understand you, and you're like maybe a half a dozen, and the other half a dozen there speak another language, and then you just say, hey, Let's gather around communication. Let's gather around language. And that's how cultures are formed. That's why there's an attack on language. That's why you've got to protect our language. Our language is biblical truth. How do you destroy, how do you intervene into a culture? Through language. That's why we protect and we fight for biblical truth. This is what brings us together. This is what defines us as, as sons and daughters of God. Does that make sense? And, and so they gather, and then suddenly this language is formed, and that other language is formed, and that other language is formed, and nations come out of that. And Genesis 12, the Lord raises up Abraham, the father of many nations. There's an Abra Abrahamic calling upon this church. Not even a church, a movement. It's an Abrahamic movement where there will be fathers that will create or that will bear fruit of sons and daughters, thinking about nations. Now, I'll say this. I don't have much time, but I mean, if you're thinking about a theological lesson here, I don't have that for you. But if you just open up, I believe there's an impartation coming upon this church for nations. And the Lord's going to start giving you uh, this burden of the Holy Spirit to intercede for nations. And you, and, and you will come and you start seeing that there will be different nations gathering in this place. And then you'll have unity in diversity. Think about that. Think about King David. Isn't it interesting that King David was the only king that was actually able to join all the tribes? He's considered the best king of Israel, the best king. And it's interesting that he, he joins the tribe, you know, the, the kingdom of the south, the north. I mean, all the tribes are under King David. Yeah, of course, he, he was a huge military man. I mean, he was a warrior. He was a worshiper. We, we could go on about all the attributes of King David. But, I mean, one of the main things was he united the family. Now, I have four kids. My dream, one of my dreams, is that all those four kids would be together. United. Maybe not geographically, but I want them in fellowship. I want them serving the Lord together. Maybe not doing the same thing, but, you know, maybe one is a business guy, the other is a politician, the other is an artist, the other is a preacher. I mean, it's kind of like the godfather back home. I'm like, you will be the politician. You will be the business guy. Whatever they are, they're going to be serving the Lord together. That's the heart of a father, right? And the Lord wants his kids together. The Lord wants his tribes together. Amen. And then, isn't it interesting that Jesus is from the root of David, not the root of Solomon. Wow. He's from the root of David. And it's only Jesus that would be able to gather all the kids under the same roof. Wow. It's only through Jesus that we'll be able to see unity in diversity. Does that make sense? And as you exalt Jesus in this place, you will see the nations gather. As you point to Jesus in this place, you will see unity in diversity. And when you see this happen, you will have a glimpse of Revelation 7-9. It'll be a prophetic picture of what you're fighting for, what you're, look, you're looking forward to. It'll be a prophetic picture of what you're worshiping towards. One day we're worshiping here, and you see a glimpse of the nations, but one day we'll be in heaven worshiping. And that is revival. We got we to gotta expand our vision for revival. Revival's got to be more than just a Pentecostal service. Yes. 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 Revival's got to be more than just, you know, 30 minutes of, of crying and shaking under the power of God in the altar. Yes. I'm all about that. I love that. I, I grew up in that. In the fire and all that. But I've seen that, you know, it's more. Yes. What does it look like to, to continue to hunger for a touch of God? Time after time after time. There's this man, and you got Mark 10 open, verse 46. Basically, Jesus and his disciples in Jericho, they're walking. There's a multitude around them. Wherever there's a multitude, a big crowd, there's a lot of noise. And in the midst of that scene, it says here, verse 46, 
blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Say with me, sat by the road. So geographically, this is where he's at. He's sitting by the road. Now, I mentioned this in the other service. Of all the four Gospels, Mark is the shortest one. If you read the, the, the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that it's very fast-paced. It moves from story to story quickly. Now, it's also very intentional. Mark is, is writing, and, and he does not waste words. He's very strategic with his, the, with his wording. And so it, when he says he's sitting by the road, there's a meaning, and there's a reason why he would mention that. So, so this guy is geographically sitting by the road where probably he would beg, you know, every day. And, you know, for years, for a long time, he's there begging. And, and Jesus is coming through, and, and wherever Jesus would walk, there would be a crowd around him. And wherever crowds are, there's a lot of noise. And, and so this blind man who's sitting by the road, hears the noise of the crowd, finds out it's Jesus. Continue with me, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, think about this. He sees something. Now, isn't it ironic that the guy's blind, but he's seen something? And there's a multitude of people that are watching with their physical eyes, but they can't see it in the spirit. For them, it's another time that Jesus will, I don't know, raise somebody who's dead or he'll heal somebody who's a cripple. He'll probably go on to a debate with the Pharisee and totally humiliate them. Uh, I don't know, he'll probably multiply food. I mean, they're, they're going after the show. I mean, and I'm not against you going after the show, but I'm just saying that, you know, the crowds are, are where the action is at. And, and, and so they're around there. But this man, I mean, he can't even go there, but he sees something in the spirit. And this, whatever he sees in the spirit, his spiritual vision causes him to discern that there is a window of opportunity here. There's a Kairos moment waiting for me. Not a Kronos but a kairos. And when we look at the word, a time in the Bible, you have the concept of chronos, measured time, and kairos, a sovereign window of the Lord. He says, there's a window here. There's an opportunity here. And I'm here to tell you that if you could only see the kairos, the kairos will redeem your chronos. Many times we're sitting around thinking, man, if I have only known this when I was young, well, if I only known this last year, if I only known that, and I've been there. The Lord rescued me, touched me, and out of the double life that I was living away in cold, my spiritual coldness, I, I thought to myself, if I only known this, Lord, I could have been doing so much more. And the Lord challenged me, would you just open your eyes to the Kairos moments I will provide in your life? And, and maybe today or this afternoon is a Kairos moment for some of us. Where the Lord will redeem chronos that has been lost. Does that make sense? And this guy sees a Kairos moment. Maybe the Lord will redeem right now the years and years of my blindness. And that fuels his desperation. His desperation is fueled to the point where he's crying out, Jesus, son of David. Now there's a crowd, remember, noise. He's thinking, my cry needs to go beyond the noise of the crowd. And it says here, verse 49, just follow with me here. It says, excuse me, verse 48, then many warn him to be quiet. Well, basically what they're doing is telling him to shut up. Shh, calm down, simmer down. Don't be so intense. See, the thing about it is, and I mentioned this in the other services as well, that I was on a podcast a few months ago and somebody asked me, uh, what's, a, what's a challenge that you've seen working with young people uh, when they get encountered by the Lord? I said, well, one of the challenges, if they're churched, if they come from Christian backgrounds, uh, most of the times the challenge or the resistance isn't coming from the world. It's coming from within the Christian ecosystem. A lot of times it's people that they go to church with. A lot of times it's relatives that are Christians. And suddenly when you get touched by the Holy Spirit, it's, it's kind of like the Lord puts you on another wavelength, another frequency. It's kind of like you just stuck yourself in a like 220 volt, you know, outlet. And you're like, ah! you're intense. I can appreciate that. 
people that are intense, passionate for the Lord, for the presence of God. And, and this guy here, they're not bothered by his noise because think about it. He's one man amongst the crowd. How much of his yelling actually is bothering their hearing? It's not about the decibels. It's about the wavelength in the spirit. It's, it's about his posture. It's the frequency that he's, he's operating in. He's intense. He's passionate. It's not about the loudness of the decibels because they're in the midst of all that roar of the crowd, but they're sensing this guy's so passionate, it's bothering me. Maybe sometimes people get bothered subconsciously. They can't put it like in words why they're bothered. And they'll just say stuff like, hey, hey, man, just, just tone down, man. I mean, you don't have to be so intense or, or you're, you're just being too emotional. Uh, just, you know, just kinda, you could be a little bit more moderate. Or you, you, I'm thinking you, you, you're starting to become a little bit fanatic. And what I've found to be true is that a lot of times it's not that they're concerned about your emotional stability. It's that the wavelength of intense you know, passion going after Jesus causes the contrast of their frequency of lukewarmness versus your frequency of hot, fiery passion for the word. And inside of them, they're saying, hey, calm down because it makes make me look bad. It makes me look lukewarm. Don't be too passionate. Just, just go along with the flow. Just follow the program. Follow the program and then it won't be bad for us. And we can just be a family that goes to church and there's nothing wrong with that. We just keep going to church as a family and that's fine. Son, just calm down. There was a story, something happened to us maybe I would say like, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I was finishing service once and this dad came up crying. And he says, Pastor, I want to talk to him. I'm like, yeah, 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 that's fine. He said, well, what's, what's up? He says, you need to pray with me and, and help our family. I said, what's going on? He says, my, my son is in drugs, and he, he, um, he'll disappear for three days. And we'll find him downtown sometimes, and, and, uh, and, and it's just, just too much. I said, well, just bring your son to me Monday or, or Tuesday at the office. I want to talk to him. So I, I met their son, 17-year-old, 16-year-old. Wasn't, you know, doing good in, in school, obviously. So we started talking, and we got a connection there. And I said, hey, why don't you just show up? Show up, and, and I'll get you something to do. He starts showing up to church office, and, and we start getting him into the flow of things. And he suddenly he starts getting discipled. And, uh, you know, then we get him through deliverance and get him through inner healing and all that kind of stuff. He's, he's clean, and now he's passionate for the Lord. Now, you fast forward maybe two years or almost three years. The dad comes to me at the end of service. Pastor, I need to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's going on? I'm worried. And he mentions his son's name. I thought to myself, oh, I just saw him the other day. He's doing great. I'm thinking, please, God, hopefully he hasn't gone back to doing what he used to do. And I said, what's wrong with him? He says, is, is, is he back? At no, 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 no. He's totally clean. No, 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 no. Praise God. That, that's not the problem. What's the problem? The problem is he doesn't want to go to college now. I said, what do you mean he doesn't want to go to college? Well, he just doesn't want to go to college. You know, you, you know in our family, everybody here is a medical doctor. And he, he, the plan was for him to be a, a medical doctor. He doesn't want to go to get his pre-med, and he doesn't want to go to medical school. I'm like, oh, okay. That, that, so what's the problem? <laughs> so he says, the problem is he doesn't want to be, go to college. I said, no, no, I, I get that, I get that. But, but he's not back in, no, no, he's, he's clean. Okay, okay. And, and, and what's the problem? Well, the problem is now he, he says he wants to go to this missions thing that you told him about. And, and that he wants to, to be a missionary in Iran. I said, is that a problem? He says, yeah, 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 because he, he needs to get his education. I'm like, I said, oh, I get, I get what's happening. I get what's happening. He looked at me, he says, you brought him to me so that I would make him a good citizen. See, you should have done that in your dinner table. Because if you bring him to me, I'll make him a martyr. Because that's the gospel. See, see, people want to live Christianity just to be, to have good citizenship. Hey, be a good citizen. Let me tell you, Jesus did not die on the cross for you to become a good citizen. I, ha I have Buddhists that are friends of mine. Muslims, they're friends of mine. They're good citizens, but they don't have Jesus. 
I know of agnostics that are good citizens, but they don't have Jesus. When Jesus bids you to come, he's asking you for everything, for everything. And so this, this passion that this blind man has is bothering people, and they're simmering him down, and Jesus listens to passion. You know, there's something about hunger that the Lord will always honor. You may not be living everything right, and you know, oh, but my life, this or that. Let me say, if you, let me tell you, if you're hungry, if you're passionate, if you're sincere, the Lord will hear your cry. Your touch will draw the anointing. And suddenly he hears his cry. And he calls him, verse 49 with me. If you, if you got it there, he says, he commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. So bipolar, because the verse before they were telling him to shut up, but now they're telling him, hey, be of good cheer. You know, you know, that shows me to not listen to the, to the opinions of others. One day they'll be patting you on the back. The other time they'll be criticizing you. I call that, we, we all need to have a Teflon heart. You know Teflon on the frying pan? People are like, the praises, slides off. The criticisms, slides off. Does that make sense? He didn't care if they were telling him to shut up. He didn't care if he was like, oh, be a good cheer. So now he's up, verse 50, throwing aside his garment. He rose and came to Jesus. Verse 51, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now look at this. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Say with me, follow Jesus on the road. Listen, the, the, the most miraculous thing that happens in this story is not a blind man gets his sight back. It's the fact that he was sitting by the road begging and he finishes the story following Jesus on the road as a disciple. That's the most miraculous thing because as much as I love the supernatural, it's a means to this movement of point A to point B. And what I've found to be true is every day we get to do this, point A to point B. And the point B of yesterday is the point A of today. And the point B of today will be the point A of tomorrow. We get to say yes to Jesus as he's moving us from by the side of the road to follow him on the road. So quickly, just some observations. Number one, desperation for the Lord. This guy was desperate. He was desperate for God. Apostle Paul says in uh, Ephesians 1 verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. Which means that if you're enlightened, you're not in darkness. And if you're not in darkness, you're not in ignorance, you're in knowledge. So he's praying that you would have spiritual knowledge through spiritual vision. If God would open your eyes to see in the spirit, you would understand the purpose or the vocation of which you have been called. That's what the verse says. So you understand your purpose. The inheritance, he says, what you received from him as a son, a daughter of the family of the king. And the incomparably great power working within you. The resources. What I've found to be the fuel for my hunger is Lord, open my eyes. I want to see beyond the earthly realm. You, know, you, you turn on the TV and you, you watch the news. You got you to manage that at times. Social media, you got to manage that at times. Because when it starts blurring your spiritual eyesight, it'll kill your hunger. It'll put you in paralysis mode. It'll put you in a place where you feel like so inadequate. And you're, and then suddenly you start thinking, why would I even bother praying? Why would I even bother fasting? Why would I even bother going after him? So if you could just keep your eyes open, it would just keep you hungry. Well, if you could just keep yourself focused on what is eternal. I didn't share this in the other services, but I'll just mention this quickly. Last month I was in Hawaii. I got a phone call. I said, hey, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of YWAM, 
and I'm sharing this because this is public. Stage four cancer. He's about to go. And uh, his family called and uh, family members said, if he's having his Genesis 49 moment, if you want to get your blessing, hurry up. And uh, he'll, he's, got a, he's got a time for you. So I just jumped on a plane and went. And um, he was so kind to pretty much block off a whole day for me. And I felt so overwhelmed by his love. God's love and Lauren's love. And I sat with him for six hours straight. And we talked about everything. Like the craziest conversations. Like, for instance, the Mennonite theology and how that impacted the socioeconomics policies of Paraguay. <laughs> that kind of conversations. All right. So I'm from, from that to everything else. And so... I'm there, and then, you know, I'm coming to that point of the conversation after six hours, and, and, and Darlene, his wife, kind of comes through the kitchen, you know, and then I kind of tell that she starts, you know, fixing things up in the kitchen. It's time for me to go, but if it's up to me, I would have left before, but Lauren doesn't stop. He's got energy now. He's, like, talking, 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 and, and I'm thinking, Lauren, you know, uh, I don't want you to, you know, if you're tired, I, I, could, I could go, and... And so finally we come to that point where I'm saying, all right, for me to get out of here, I've got to ask him to pray and lay hands on me, and then I'm out the door. Lord, will you pray for me? Impartation, last. And as he's praying, so I'm, kneel, I'm kneeling right next to his chair, and he's got his hands over me. I'm praying. I'm receiving impartation. And uh, for those of you who don't know this, this is uh, the founder of YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And, you know, 65 years preaching the same message. He started why when he was 22. He's 87 years old. You know, never diverted from the call of God in his life, you know. A general. Right? It's to the point that when they called me up, they said, hey, we got March 23rd down for you to come. And as I was coming, they had just told me, Franklin Graham came with his jet, landed, got four hours with Lauren, got prayer from Lauren, jumped back on his jet, whoo, flew back out. And he's been doing that with a bunch of generals in the body of Christ. People from all the nations are coming to get this last Genesis 49 moment with him. And so there I am, right? And I'm, I'm kneeling, before, you know, receiving prayer. And I'm thinking, I've never been in this position because as soon as he says amen, I'm going to have to say uh, goodbye to somebody who's alive, knowing that next time that I see him will be in heaven. So, so how, how does this work? I mean, I've never been in this position, right? So I'm thinking maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry. I don't know. I mean, I think it would be polite for me to cry. Um, I can't be too casual. I got to be, you know, but, I'm, but I know how he is. And so he, he's not going to want that mushy, mushy thing. And so I'm thinking. So finally he says, amen. So I get up, right? And it's time for me to say goodbye to him. And so I give him a hug. And then he says, all right, bro. See you on the other side. That's so casual. So casual. So I walk out. I'm walking through his garage thinking to, to my car. I'm thinking, what the heck? What the heck? You, you know, I'm just trying to. And I'm like in the car driving out. And I'm thinking, Lord, I just feel the Lord say. It's so casual because his heart's always been in eternity. When your heart's so much in this thing here, it's a divorce. It's like, Argh. but when you when you live here with your eyes open to what's eternal, it's like, hey, I'm going there. It's more natural. Does that make sense? And I was just convicted. I'm like, hey, are are you valuing earthly things more than you should? Are you is your conversation around things that are gonna pass how much of your world is just stuck on on oh the economy oh this or oh, that oh the crisis oh the election oh that I, you know I got my opinions and you have yours but but the, the end of the day is it's not gonna matter who won the elections or how much the dollar is worth when we get to eternity it won't matter and so the, this casual thing is not that he wasn't polite or that he didn't absorb the reality of what death is is 
once you're living for that your whole life, decades living for that, it just becomes something, hey, all right, I'll see you. And that charge, <laughs> you know, a few times during that conversation, pointing the finger at me saying, do you have the word of the Lord? I said, yes, sir. So do something. All right. And later on, you know, his family said, you know, that was the most loving thing he could say. Do something. Because he believes he got a word of the Lord. Do something. Don't, don't question, is this it? This, is, this man is so desperate, he's crying out, Jesus. Desperation. Desperation for God is a gift from God. And finally, he's called by Jesus. And the thing he does is he throws away his cloak, the verse 50 says. And quick, quick fact about the cloak is that during those times, the Pharisees or the high priests, they weren't just religious leaders. They were sanitary leaders, which means that they acted and basically functioned as physicians. And so they had to examine people and they would say, like a doctor would say, you, you, you have this disease or you have this situation or this condition. And, and so they would have to go present themselves to the high priest if they had a you know a special need and they would actually the high priest would say no you're not faking to be blind so you don't have to work and beg and make money that way you're actually blind and to prove that you're legitimately blind I'll give you a cloak and that's what they did it was the official authorization to beg because they weren't expected to work so they would sit by the road with the cloak given to them by the by the high priest and they would beg and a Jewish man that would be faithful to the law would be faithful with his tithes, his offerings, and his alms. And his alms would be counted as justice to him once he would give his alms to somebody with a cloak. And he throws away his cloak. Now, mind you, before he's healed. And I could think that his buddies are saying, hey, Bartimaeus, maybe you should hold on to your cloak. Maybe you should have a plan B. He's like, no plan B for me. And he just goes. And the Lord starts speaking to me about physical steps that puts you in the faith zone. And we all want the supernatural, but the fact is, you don't get the supernatural until you're at the end of the rope of your natural. When you've done everything that's naturally possible, then he'll come with the supernatural. He did everything that was come and that was available to him. He throws away his cloak. He steps into the faith zone. In the faith zone is where the miracles happen. And he's there. He's ready to receive a miracle from the Lord. It's the step of faith. It's the step of obedience. It's that radical, obedient step that puts him totally dependent on the Lord for a miracle. And Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And now, we would think it's obvious he needs to get healed, he's blind, but he could say, he could have said, I need a new cloak, I need money, I need food, I don't know. But he says, Rabbi, I want to see, which is an invitation to prayer. Now, not only is it an invitation to prayer, but if you think about it, beggars don't get to choose. And he's giving this man dignity by saying, you have a power of choice. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. And he invites him into prayer. Because prayer is nothing more, nothing less than a heaven or an earthly permission for a heavenly invasion. I heard somebody say once that God in his sovereign unlimited power chooses to limit his power to our life of prayer because he wants to co-labor with us and he's given us free will to ask him would you come into my marriage would you come into the way that I am relating to my son would you come into my workplace would you come into my finances would you come into my physical health into my mental health would you come into my desperation for you you're inviting the Lord to invade your earth and I would actually risk it and say that every prayer you pray is in essence the Lord's prayer may your kingdom come may your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. When you're praying for healing, somebody you love in the hospital bed, you're saying, Lord, heaven has healing. Would you bring healing on this hospital bed as it is in heaven? Your kingdom come. Whether that be your finances, whether it be your relationships, whether that be a family crisis, I don't, I don't know what it is, but at the end of the day, you're always praying, would your kingdom come? And when he says, I want to see, Jesus has the permission to intervene. And when he intervenes, automatically the response is, I'm not going to be sitting by the road. I'll be with you on the road. Point A to point B. The Lord wants to take us from point A to point B. The Lord, and let me tell you, and I'll finish with this. The Lord wants to renew our hunger. There's a fresh deposit of hunger. Even now, I just sense it in the spirit. Right now, in this atmosphere, there's a deposit of fresh hunger. There's a deposit of conviction. The Lord is looking for convicted Christians, convicted disciples. He says, I'll just throw this cloak. I know what I got to do. I'll take that step. The Lord is, is looking for those that are allowing him to intervene into his situation or to her situation. So I want to finish off praying for you. This is what we're going to do. We have a little bit more time. And I know this is like the, the, the service that goes a little bit longer. But if you could just close your Bible and just keep yourself seated. And if I uh, just take anything away from your lap and just relax in the presence of your father. I'm going to pray that Holy Spirit would just touch us today. And you don't have to pray. I'll pray for you. All you got to do is just open yourself, open your heart. And I'm believing that the Holy Spirit will touch us today. So Holy Spirit, we recognize you in this place. We ask you that you would touch our hearts. We ask you that you would renew fire in us. We ask you that you would blow in the sails of our hearts. Would you come with your fire? Would you come with your power? Father, would you renew hunger? Would you renew desperation? Would you renew this passion that Bartimaeus carried? As he saw something in the spirit, would you renew it in us? Open the eyes of our heart so that we would hunger for things that are not of this earth for things that are eternal. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts with your fire. Bring conviction. We invite you and we give you permission. Quickly with your own words, just ask him to touch you. Can we wait for a few seconds as he touches us? Lord, come with your fire. Come with your power. May you speak to Santo de Deus. My soul. My soul. Sopra nesse lugar. Intensifica tua presença. your sense and even as we're praying the heat of the Holy Spirit it's the fire of God touching your body as a physical sign that he's touching you you may be sensing tremors that's a sign of the Holy Spirit you may be sensing electricity that's a size sign of the Holy Spirit weeping you don't know why you're weeping that's a touch of the Holy Spirit goosebumps if you're physically sensing any of these manifestations I've just described, can you just stand up as a sign of recognition? Holy Spirit, I recognize you're here. I recognize you're touching my life. 
I recognize you're doing a work in me. Only if you're sensing it physically, not by faith, but physically. If you're sensing the power of God touch you, the fire of the Lord. If you're sensing the presence of the Lord surrounding you, touching your body, just stand up. If you sense it as I'm start praying, even as it begins, just stand up. Just stand up. Lord, I pray that you would intensify your presence here. I pray that you double your presence here. More fire. More fire. More fire. More, Lord. Would you mark us? Mark us like you marked Bartimaeus. Today we pray that you would intensify your touch. More power, Lord. More conviction. Father. More, 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 more. Father, I pray right now, even as we're standing in your presence, and even those that aren't standing, it's by faith, it's not by feelings. Sometimes you get the feelings, sometimes you don't. Regardless, it's by faith. Just receive it, by faith. And even as you're sensing something, if you may sense it later on, just stand up, stand up. More God, more Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would release right now angelic encounters. Father, I just pray for prophetic dreams. Would you release prophetic dreams right now? More, more. Power encounters, Father God. Whoa. More, Lord, more, Lord. Father, I pray that you renew the first love. Renew the first love. Awaken in us passion for your presence. Some of you will wake up tomorrow with the new hunger that you haven't sensed in years will put you in a season of prayer and fasting of just going after in your secret place it's this wind it's this grace it's the wind behind your back father just pray would you intensify right now some of you are just having awakened in you even your hands are tingly it's a sign of a healing anointing coming upon your life and you will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed and if you pray for the sick and put it in practice you will see the Lord performs signs and wonders through your hands. Father God, I just pray for fresh boldness. Some of you that felt like, I wish I could speak out. I wish I could share. I wish I could witness. There's something that's going to just, an impulse inside of you that just push you. It's a boldness. It's the boldness of the apostles of Acts chapter 4. Pushing you to speak out. And if you open your mouth, the Lord will put the words in your mouth. Some of you will start getting words of knowledge. The Lord is renewing the gifts. Faith, faith, the gift of faith. You will look at mountains and you will really believe that the Lord will move those mountains. It's a conviction inside of you. So Father, I pray, would you intensify, intensify, intensify your touch, your presence in our midst. Father, I pray that whatever is begun here right now in our hearts, that it would just continue even throughout the day even as we sleep as we wake up that we would sense your presence and wake up in a new dimension take us to a next level lord next level of hunger next level of thirst father just pray father that there would be a clear a clear father god difference even of hunger for legacy i pray right now would you just take us into a new pursuit, a new pursuit? That's what I hear. We love you, Jesus. If you pray in the Spirit, just pray in the Spirit. If you have a spiritual song, just offer it up to the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We have a team that will be happy to pray for anybody that needs ministry. Todd is down here. If you don't know Todd, he's wearing the green hat. There'll be some other people to join him. If you need prayer, I don't want you to leave the room 
without receiving prayer. We have some people who will help, some students. If you're in the room, join us as part of the prayer team. If you need prayer, I don't want you to hesitate. You just come to the front and we have a team here ready to serve you. I know it's almost two, so if you're a parent, you can go grab your kiddos. We're so grateful. We're so, so grateful for the presence of the Lord moving among us so strongly and healing and encountering us today. Jesus, we wanna say thank you so much for everything that you're doing in this room and doing within our hearts. Father, I believe with everything in me that you have marked us today for a renewed future and we receive every word that was released today from Pastor Teofilo. We receive it into the seedbed of our hearts but also into the foundation of our church. God, we ask that you would water this seed today and that you would bring forth abundant fruit. Father, I pray that we would would be able to mark this day on our calendar and say that was a day that there was an impartation of hunger and an impartation of desperation and there was something that shifted in the atmosphere of Legacy Nashville on that day that projected us towards a greater future in you more of what you have for us God a greater vision and a greater promise in Jesus name we pray and if you'd say it with me, church, just as a confirmation and an affirmation of all that God has done today, let's just say amen, amen, and amen. If you need prayer, I want you to come up. Uh, Daniel will continue to play just for a moment longer. And so I would love it because I know the Holy Spirit is moving in the room. If we could just keep the room as a space of prayer, not a space of connection. So if you want to with one another not fellowship if you want to fellowship please just go to the lobby like I said if you have uh, if you have kiddos uh, go pick them up but if you're staying in here come to the front or you can be seated right where you are and just continue to commune with the Lord we love you so much we're so happy you're here uh, come to dinner parties this week as well as church next weekend we love you